Yeah, so it seems to be on. Okay, guys, last session. Hey. <laughs> uh, so, P2P networking. So, we kind of came here to uh, learn about ideas from the research team, and then we were asked to do uh, a session, so we don't <laughs> didn't really know what to talk about. So, what we're going to talk about is mostly like the existing system, and then in the end, I think we're going to have some kind of reverse Q and A session where like, we ask some questions, and then you guys <laughs> have the answers. Let's see. Uh, okay. So let's start um, in the in the P2P network that we have. Um, yeah, what's the best way to say this? So I guess um, the P2P network that we have is built on a bunch of tools, and the tools that we have is like a discovery mechanism that can relay node metadata, so you can yeah see what nodes are up to. Uh, the main it runs on an unstructured P2P network with the more or less random topology, so it doesn't really matter which exact node you're connected to, you can just be connected to yeah, any node basically, as long as it's reasonably well connected, everything works. And um, yeah, specifically in Go Ethereum, we also have a structured P2P network on the Swarm side, and that thing can come in handy for some purposes, but um, it's not used for the Ethereum blockchain at the moment. And uh, the protocol framework on which it runs is the Dev P2P protocol framework, and that's um, present in all of the Ethereum implementations. Uh, it was designed in 2014 and hasn't really changed much. And um, yeah, it contains separate like protocols for for, for for the for the functions listed earlier. So there's uh, no, the no discovery protocol, which is a UDP based DHT. Um, there's a TCP transport protocol that uh, yeah, transmits all the data. And then on top of the transfer protocol, there's an application layer on which these sort of uh, sub-protocols can be mounted. And we have a bunch of sub-protocols, and one of them is the EVE protocol. And um, yeah, like I said, the EVE protocol is this protocol that nodes use to talk about the blockchain. And it uses this random topology. And uh, with the ETH protocol, you can relay new blocks, you can relay new transactions or existing transactions, and you can download block headers, block bodies, receipts, and state data. So when you connect to someone, you can kind of see it here. Um, yeah, that you found some node using the DHT, and then uh, when you connect to it, you exchange information about the blockchain on the application layer, and that information includes the Genesis block, the network ID, and some other information that's not in this diagram, like the uh, total difficulty of both sides. And then for block relay, it's kind of similar to Bitcoin, I guess, so uh, we propagate blocks uh, as long as they have valid proof of work, even before executing them. Uh, the full block is sent to the square root of all the current peers, and then for the rest of the peers, there's a notification that there is a new block, but most of the time the peer will have received the block from, from some of its peers. Um, and in case they haven't actually received it, they will kind of just fetch it a couple of seconds later. And then uh, to sort of dampen this relay, there's uh, for, for each peer, there's like a set of uh, recent blocks that have, have been seen. And then for transactions, it's, it's kind of similar. So we also have the set. And then um, uh, when the, in the beginning of the connection, we just sort of start dribbling all the transactions that we know about and um, it, from both sides. And then, yeah, usually if, it, if everything works out, then we're not, yeah, we, 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 the, after this process, both sides are going to know about the same transaction. Right. And then the final function of this protocol is the blockchain sync. And this is kind of where he comes in, and he can explain all about how that works. So you got here quite fast. So um, I guess most of you are kind of know how, in theory, how thank you, how the whole uh, synchronization works. So uh, the point that I would like to make uh, through the next few slides is not really how the synchronization algorithm itself works or how how Ethereum benefits from it, rather all the, rather the different challenges that we've met while implementing these synchronization mechanisms from a networking perspective. 
And the reason why we would like to talk about a bit about these is because in the last couple of days we've seen a few slides, a few uh, uh, sentences dropped here and there that, yeah, we'll just swap out this Kaya with network and everything is done. And those can, those are a bit strong um, sentences. So networking-wise, there are a few quite important networking fallacies that people need to be aware. And although most people here, I guess, are designing consensus engines and uh, sharding and whatnot, but I think it's really, really important not to lose sight of the networking issues. Otherwise, we'll end up with uh, with a few gotchas that uh, current synchronization really, really suffers from, which are designed gotchas in upstream, uh, sorry, in, in higher level uh, uh, protocols or high, higher level uh, data structures. So uh, essentially, uh, Go Ethereum itself has uh, three uh, synchronization modes, uh, full sync, fast sync, and light sync. Um, from uh, the highest uh, level of perspective, a full sync basically just uh, uh, fetches all the blocks from the network and runs all the transactions with them. After it ran all the block, uh, transactions, yay, you're in sync. Now, uh, fast, the problem with this uh, method, of course, is that uh, this works fine when the chain is small, but eventually transaction execution really, really blows up. And then you, everything just slows down. So as uh, far as I know, Gavin was the one who designed the fasting protocol. And the benefit of that was that instead of uh, running all the transactions, uh, you could uh, just download everything, and including the state. So download the blocks, download the receipts, download the state. Since the headers already have all the Merkle proofs for the state, as long as you trust that the header chain is valid, and you trust that because you have a huge proof of work on it, um, you can trust that the state will be valid too. Especially if you can mine a few blocks on top, or a few blocks have already been mined on top. So in theory, it's a really, really elegant way to replace uh, computation with bandwidth. And of course, the last uh, this worked fine for quite a long time in Ethereum, but um, Obviously, if you want to run on a mobile phone or small devices, and uh, sadly, even consumer laptops start to count as small devices nowadays, uh, fast sync, even fast sync is getting really, really slow because simply the chain is about 60 gigs in prune state, so it, it's just too large. And that's why we, uh, we introduced uh, the light sync, where it's kind of similar to fast sync in that you download the entire header chain, but everything else is downloaded on demand. So it's kind of like an on-demand fast sync bit of souped up version. But, so in theory, this is how it works on a high level. And everyone, everybody kind of expects that this works without too many challenges. Now I would like to prove you wrong. Hopefully to, to take care and then you design the next uh, sharding uh, stuff that we need to then put on the peer-to-peer -peer network. So, uh, well, first up, let's start with full sync. So, in theory, full sync is get the blocks and import them, duh. So what, what could go wrong? And well, my first question is, let's suppose that we have 25 peers connected. Uh, who do I download the blocks from? In theory, I can have five different peers. I can have peers that freshly join the network and are completely useless to me. I can have peers that uh, have stale data. Maybe they have only half the blockchain, which data might be higher than mine or might be lower than mine. So it's, again, a good question. I have a few lucky peers which are in sync with the network, those are really valuable ones. Then I have, I can have, actually I will have quite a few peers that are on a forked chain. For example, Ethereum Classic or there are a few other clones of Ethereum. It's really funny when you see something, uh, some weirdo coin connected to you. And of course, uh, one really, really important class of uh, nodes that we must not forget about are malicious nodes. Uh, these are probably not prevalently present in the network. Uh, the point is to make sure that they don't get present in the network. So we kind of must ensure that uh, it's not really possible to abuse it. So if we have five of these types of nodes and we have absolutely no idea who is who, then who do we sync with? Well, the only thing that we know and that peers tell us currently are their block height, which is completely useless or their latest block hash, which is completely useless, or their total difficulty. Now, the total difficulty, in theory, is a very useful thing, because I know that the person who has the highest total difficulty, that one has the best chain. Now, there's a single catch. I cannot verify it. So essentially, I can connect to anybody and tell them that I have a 10 gazillion uh, 
a chain of 10 gazillion blocks and however large difficulty and they won't be able to tell me otherwise. And uh, I can play around with, uh, with, with block, uh, block numbers and total difficulty, difficulty calculations. So I can fake it quite well to, to fake, basically to, to try and trick somebody to think that I have a higher difficulty than in reality I have. So the best that we currently can do is actually pick the highest one and then go from there. But we, when we do this, we must actually be aware that that might be an attacker. Okay, so uh, we know who we want to sing from, ideally. Uh, but let's suppose that I have one million block. Now, which block do I start to sing from? The obvious, the naive answer is one million and one. Uh, the practical problem is that uh, there might have been a reorg since I synchronized last, or since I turned off my machine. This means that actually there might have been a short reorg, let's say just a couple of blocks. I can handle this quite easily. I just uh, ask the remote node not just for his uh, head, or let's sorry, sorry, let's suppose that I'm at block one million. Instead of continuing at block one million and one, I go a bit down a few blocks. And if the remote node sends me blocks that I already know, I'm happy. We know that I have the common ancestor. We can sing from there. Now, if I have a deeper reorg, which usually doesn't happen on mainnet, but it's important, let's suppose, uh, 1,000 blocks. That does, won't happen usually in the mainnet. But if clients go out of sync for, due to a consensus issue, and then all of a sudden uh, one client goes off, and let's suppose that GoEthereum is the one who is at fault. Now we fix the consensus is issue, but uh, we have to reorg 100 blocks. Then all of a sudden that's a problem because that's a deep reorg, and we have to find our um, that our common ancestor between the other chain, which is on a completely different fork. And for that, we can actually do a binary search to find the common ancestor, basically just uh, trying from, I could say, from the genesis block to our chain head, and just keep request, uh, doing a binary search and requesting rich, uh, remote headers until I found a, find a common one. And that will be most probably our common ancestor. Uh, an interesting thing that even here, if I'm trying to synchronize from attacker, they can actually say that their common ancestor is way below their true, um, true, true chain. So we actually do extra checks, so that if, uh, if somebody says that they are, uh, our common ancestor is block one million, and it turns out that we have, we share common blocks above them, then we immediately assume that it's, uh, it's a malicious mode and disconnect. However, we still have a third option, so if I have a reorg of 1,000 blocks, that's nice, but if I have a reorg of uh, 1 million blocks, that's a problem. So probably nobody can uh, meaningfully attack the network at the current proof of work difficulty. So you, I can't just go and mine 100 blocks, but I can actually mine 100 blocks on the genesis state because that's fairly cheap, easy. So it's uh, also really important to know that uh, you not only have to take care that uh, you handle reorgs, but you have to have a limit on how deep you are willing to go. I think, um, yeah, okay. So uh, I'm not really sure, go with him, I think maybe allows one or two epochs deep reorg. The idea behind was that was to handle a, a crazy enough um, forks or consensus issues, but without actually exposing us to attacks. Okay, so let's suppose I, I know which peer I want to synchronize with, and I know what block I want to download stuff from. Then um, the question is that, let's say I start pulling blocks, it's fairly going okay, and then all of a sudden I see a new peer that joined me, which has a lot faster network connection. Do I switch to it? Or let's say I have a new peer connected, which has a much higher total difficulty advertised. Do I connect to it? Or do I switch syncing from my old peer to my new peer? And the answer in both of these cases is a huge no, because uh, the problem is that it doesn't really matter what kind of heuristics I add to switch peers. An attacker can always fake those metrics. So I can start up a node in the local network. That will be the fastest. And I can advertise a huge total difficulty on it. That will be the largest. So my, my node has absolutely no chance against such an attacker. So the answer here is that since the network is untrusted and every crap that can come over the network will come over eventually the network, you need to ensure that uh, 
you treat it, treat network traffic accordingly. And the really important thing here to know is that a crappy peer is infinitely better than a, an attacker. So uh, if by some chance we found a peer that is really slow, really shitty, really horrible in every aspect, but it does something, then it, it, you have to have a huge reason why you would switch away from it. Of course, this opens a few problems. Uh, how do we actually maximize bandwidth? So I can, let's suppose I can, I have 25 peers, some of them are slow peers, some of them are fast peers, some of them just don't want to give me any data. Um, if I keep downloading data from a single peer, that won't scale. It will just be a bottleneck. So what I could do is I take my original peer that I decided to sync with, I download all the headers from the original peer. Those can be verified, proof of work, hash, uh, hashes, everything. And after I have the header chain downloaded, I can actually download everything else concurrently. Because everything else can be verified and matched up with the headers. Of course, that's, uh, that kind of seems perfect. But then comes the interesting question. If I have a really slow peer and a really fast one, then the slow one will always block the fast. Now, in, if you, you think about BitTorrent or similar protocols, this is not a problem because we just download a 10 gigabyte file, eventually the fast one will fill most of it, the slow one will fill a few chunks, and that's fine. But in our case, we don't really download, so we cannot download uh, the entire thing at one go. We kind of have to download and process kind of, kind of like a stream, kind of like watching a movie. So you, when you watch a movie, you don't really care whether you have the last 10 minutes if you haven't watched the first 10 minutes yet. So it's always important to, um, to prioritize the first blocks or the first data chunks. And um, this would still not be the biggest problem. The larger problem is that uh, um, I don't have, I have a limited queue to queue blocks up. So um, if, uh, if I want to download, let's say my queue is 1,000 headers and I uh, slow peer blocks up 100 headers, I can use a fast peer to fill up the rest, but I still have to wait for the slow peer to, to finish uh, sending me data so that I can process that 1,000 blocks. And then it happens again and again and again. And essentially what I'm doing is that uh, every, for every single queue size, I'm just stop, I just stop for, basically my, uh, my latency will be the latency of the, my slowest peer, or give or take. And that's, uh, that's a problem. And uh, for that, what Coethion does is that it constantly tries to estimate the capacity and the bandwidth of each peer. And whenever we download something concurrently from the network, if we know that it's a fast peer, we ask for more data. If we know it's a sm uh, slow peer, we ask for less data. And the idea is that we want that stream to be constantly running. And um, this kind of looks OK. It performs quite well. But uh, it still has a bottleneck. So now the, the massive amounts of data are downloaded concurrently, but the small amount of data, the header chain, is still downloaded from a single peer. And uh, you might say that, yes, but the header is 500 bytes, so downloading a, single, uh, downloading a header chain from a single uh, peer is OK. That's true, unless that single peer is Raspberry Pi, in which case you're screwed. And, uh, that's one, one class of problems if it's a Raspberry Pi. The other class of problems is that single peer which, on which we're trying to download headers from is a malicious one who just doesn't send us headers or sends us very slowly. Then again, we are pretty much screwed because we'll never finish syncing. And uh, so the, uh, the way you go with Ethereum solve this issue is that instead of downloading each and every header from the, oh yeah, an important thing to know is that it's uh, really hard to download headers concurrently because you cannot verify them. So to verify a header, a header, you need its parent. However, what we can do is we assume that the master peer is trusted, is good. Now what happens if we assume that this peer that we download headers from is good? Well, instead of downloading every header from it, we can download just the header skeleton. What that means is that, let's suppose that I download 200 headers, but between every header I place 200 uh, empty blocks, basically a gap of 200. And then I can actually backfill those gaps from the network concurrently. I can ask the, uh, anyone for those data. And those, what the gaps, the way I fill them, is that they slightly overlap with the, 
with the actual skeleton. And this way, uh, as long as my uh, master peer is trusted and didn't send me junk, everything that I, uh, basically all the other headers can be correctly verified and linked up to this. Uh, and it, I surely have the same data as the master peer. Now, of course, there are the problems here is that, uh, okay, the advantages first. The advantage is, of course, that uh, it doesn't matter how slow my master peer is because it just needs to give me 200 headers and I can convert that to 40,000 headers concurrently from the network. So as long as I have a fast peer, I don't care about whether the master peer is slow or not. But of course the problem is what happens if, um, if my master peer is a good peer, I'm golden. If my master peer is a, an attacker, now I'm in a problem. Then it might feed me junk. But the good thing is that if I cannot fill the gaps uh, from the network, and I cannot fill the gaps, not even with the master peer itself, that it means that I got junk and I immediately disconnect. And uh, the huge benefit of this is that even though uh, I said that we never ever uh, disconnect or never ever swap out our master peer, it's really important that it has two properties. One of the properties is that uh, if, we, if it's an attacker, we try to detect it immediately, as soon as possible, so it has very little time to screw with us. And the second is if, uh, um, yes, I forgot. Anyway, <laughs> so the idea is to try to uh, keep attackers away and stick to good nodes. Now, this way, um, it kind of seems like a really, really uh, operational synchronization mechanism. I can download stuff really fast. Um, but there are still one class of problems which turns up eventually on mainnet. And the problem is that uh, there are lots of nodes in the network which have crappy connection. And I myself might have crappy connection. So for example, if I rent the latest, newest, and greatest the virtual machine from Amazon with a huge pipe, a huge processing capacity and everything, and I start it up, what happens currently on mainnet is that 25 Raspberry Pi caliber computers will immediately leech onto me, simply because they are looking for peers. And even if some of them are in sync, or some of them are halfway in sync, it's a huge problem because they simply cannot saturate my capacity. And, uh, and this is, a, this is a quite a significant issue because then I, the reason I cannot sync is not because I have problems, capacity problems, it's because my peers have capacity problems. So um, originally, GoEthereum solved this with timeouts. The, I think the original implantation that we launched in the Frontier had a three second timeout. It worked beautifully, except when we got a bug report that GoEthereum doesn't sync. And we tried to figure out why we couldn't. And in the end, it turned out that the guy reporting the bug was in a remote village in New Zealand and had a latency of three seconds, satellite latency. So a three second latency coupled with a three second timeout is uh, not the best uh, choice. So and uh, uh, the obvious answer is just raise the timeout but if I raise the timeout, then all of a sudden I just reintroduce all my other bugs that, uh, that I simply cannot throw off slow peers fast enough and I just get stuck. Mm -hmm. And so the, what we actually came up with, our solution was, that instead of timeouts, which are hard to, to sort, we uh, try, to, um, try to calculate an expected round trip time that we expect from our peers. Originally, this expected round trip time starts at three seconds, the original timeout. So if I have a really fat machine with a fat pipe and I find, find uh, fast peers, then I, I enforce the three second timeout. Anyone above that will get dropped. However, if I don't, if I cannot sync, if I don't get data, then this the timeout, uh, this expected round trip time uh, slowly goes up. And eventually I will find some peers that, uh, that can satisfy those constraints. And let's suppose that I, this uh, expected time goes up to one minute. The one minute is still quite huge, but let's suppose I have shitty peers. And then all of a sudden I get a really good peer. Now, since I got the new really good peer, it doesn't really make sense to keep the old shitty ones around because that new peer alone can satisfy my entire download requirements. So at that point, this expected round trip time starts going down and eventually only the really fast peers can satisfy the constraints and everything else gets dropped off. Now this might seem a bit uh, like playing nasty with Raspberry Pis or slow machines, but it's important to emphasize that uh, we only do this during sync. So when we initially synchronize a node, 
then honestly, we don't give a damn about Raspberry Pis. We want to sync up fast. Then after we're in sync, then we can talk about uh, helping others, or at least helping really, really slow peers. And uh, more or less, that is the entire fast sync uh, challenges that we um, we solved. And we're kind of quite happy that this this protocol manages to saturate uh, quite a lot, quite a nice bandwidth. But of course, uh, full sync is always uh, limited by transaction processing. So uh, this is where. Uh, sorry. Wait. And this is essentially where fasting comes in. That instead of processing the transactions, fasting kind of just downloads all the transactions. Oh, so downloads everything essentially. Now, um, if we just implement fasting as is and try to run it, we'll still see that uh, fasting cannot saturate our download link. And why not? Well, one of the answers is if I run it, uh, run the fasting on my uh, old laptop, about ten year old laptop. Uh, importing, downloading and importing the first 3,000 blocks takes, I don't know, maybe three seconds. And uh, verifying the ET hash on top of them takes five seconds. So essentially, uh, for fast sync, the first bottleneck was uh, ET hash verification. And uh, so the trick that we actually did is that uh, it doesn't really make, so if, if I'm processing blocks one by one and run all the transactions, then it's actually important to verify the proof of work. Now, if I have to download five million blocks, then does it make sense to verify the proof of work for every single one of them? And the answer is no. So if I verify them at random, so maybe verify every one out of 2,000, I just gave a number, I don't really remember the exact numbers. If I verify only one out of a few thousand, or one out of a few hundred, then I can save a huge processing time on, uh, on proof of work verification, and, uh, but I still have the same security. So fasting essentially just sparsely verifies the proof of works of the chain, and as you reach the chain head, the last blocks, there it actually verifies everything. So if you actually manage to verify the proof of work of the of mainnet with the current head blocks, then probably everything below it is fine. And this actually uh, really, really, really significantly speeds up uh, fast synchronization. So with this optimization, I can actually saturate my home link, which is, uh, which is nice. Of course, uh, we still have a problem. ETH hash comes back anyway. If I want to run on uh, lower power devices, for example, a mobile phone, then generating the ETH hash cache is again significantly slower than the network bandwidth. So on, on my phone, which is a fairly new phone, uh, it takes three and a half minutes to generate an ETH hash cache. So that's the small one, that's the 30 megabyte one. So that's horrible. And essentially what happens is normally if you just uh, start downloading blocks and verify um, and generate ETH hash cache when you need it, then you will just have these three minute uh, gaps in synchronization. And this, you don't really see this on a laptop or on a big machine. But it's on mobile devices, it's really important that uh, ETH hash cache generations actually run concurrently with uh, synchronization, with downloading stuff. And even more so uh, for us, it really helped to actually memory have map everything so that when you restart your nodes, then, uh, then you don't have to again regenerate these caches. So these were uh, two of the really optimizations that, uh, that are really weird, that uh, they have nothing to do with synchronization, but they were the ones that we actually limited synchronization. Okay, and then come the nasty challenges. So uh, with, with fasting, we have two interesting properties. One of them is that the size of the state is significantly less than the size of the chain. Um, I don't have exact numbers, but approximately the chain, meaning blocks, uh, receipts, are 56 gigabytes, and the state is maybe four gigabytes, just approximate numbers. So in theory, it should be really, really fast to download the blockchain, sorry, the state, and slower to download the chain itself. The issue is that the number of state entries is significantly, insanely larger than the number of chain entries. So the blockchain has five million uh, uh, components, so to say. 
and the state try has 105 million, give or take. And what this ends up with is that uh, actually downloading 4 gigabytes is significantly longer than downloading 56 gigabytes. That's again something that really hits you and something that you wouldn't expect. And uh, the entire, if, you, if you're wondering what the issue is, the issue is latency. So I cannot download too much data in a single request, and if I have to make a million requests and each one take uh, 50 milliseconds, then it's just crazy. And uh, so one trick that we actually try to do here, it's a really a very old tr trick, is uh, that whenever we uh, fasting tries to download its stuff, and whenever the fasting is actually downloading the chain, it is concurrently already downloading the the state. And the only way to download the state is fetch the header, the head header from the peer that we're syncing with, uh, pray that it's actually not an attacker, and start synchronizing the state try from it. And if it turns out that it's an attacker, then it should turn out fairly quickly. So I don't, yeah, I wasted some bandwidth, but I discard that. And if it turns out that it was a good node, then I'm golden. And by the time I actually download all the blocks, I should have, in theory, most of the state available. Yeah, that was the theory that lasted up until about a year ago. It still holds for test nets. Uh, for mainnet, uh, the latencies and the whole added round trip time is so much outweighs everything that, for example, on my machine and my home internet connection, it takes about one hour to download the entire chain and 10 hours to add the four gigabytes on top. So that's, that's something to think about. Okay, and then of course there are some other challenges, for example, that uh, um, as far as I know, so Parity I think always had uh, state pruning. Uh, we also introduced state pruning a few releases ago, which means that uh, the expected availability, data availability of uh, the state itself, the state tries 16 minutes. So it doesn't matter what I, what I start to download after 16 minutes, it's not, it's not available anymore. Or at least only the common stuff is available. And um, it, this one actually requires quite a few networking tricks to keep, keep downloading the headers concurrently and keep jumping forward with the state sync, uh, not to essentially to keep, keep up with the, the dynamically changing data. And, um, Okay, but what's, um, so in theory, fasting is kind of a nice algorithm, it's a really elegant design, but what's the really big problems with it? Well, the first problem is that each block currently on mainnet kind of deletes a thousand tri nodes and introduces about 2,000 new tri nodes, which means that's about 200 tri, tri node modifications per second. It's an insanely dynamically changing data, the state tri, and the horrible aspect of it is that uh, the state tri is essentially mapping hashes to hashes. So the key of a hash uh, of node is a hash, the contents are just one hash or multiple hash, so it's um, data content-wise, it's really uniformly randomly distributed. This means that it both trashes my local database, so if I download the state try, I have to insert it all over the place. It has a huge, huge overhead on my local database. It also has a huge overhead on the remote size database, because even looking up the data, is uh, the disk just jumps over, all over the place. And uh, this is a typical place where, in theory, the networking aspects should have been trivial, and uh, the higher level data structure does com just completely screwed it, and still does. Okay, then um, I, I already hi highlighted that uh, mainnet has 105 million state entries, which means uh, if I need, we need to download that in any with any constant multiplier, maybe we, I can download 100 at a time, 1,000 at a time, it really doesn't matter. It's still um, something that the latency itself is what, uh, what fa so fasting isn't slow because you cannot handle the bandwidth, it's slow because you cannot handle the latency. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, if from user experience side, it's really, really nasty that the state tries sizes cannot be calculated in advance. So you do not know how many uh, try nodes I need to download, so I just keep downloading, downloading, and then users are angry that they have been downloading for two hours now and have no idea what's going on. And I still can't help them because I myself do not know how large the try is. 
Now, um, so what are the kind of the takeaways from uh, from this um, fasting? The issues with fasting. The takeaways that you all should make. Uh, the network fall uh, networking fallacies. Well, one of them is that uh, even network programmers kind of assume that latency is small or that latency doesn't matter. And uh, as you can see here, actually latency is what breaks it. So that's the single thing that breaks fasting. So whenever you design a consensus protocol and assume that you can get something fast across, you can't. The other, um, other really important thing to keep in mind, or the other network fall fallacy, is that uh, your network is homogeneous, for example. That's also a huge uh, problem, because you have nodes of all kinds in your network. Some will be performant, most of them will be horrible, and some will just try to screw things up. And uh, if, you don't, if you cannot handle the presence of all of those nodes, then everything can go wrong, especially if you are the crappy one. For example, if you're on an airplane or if you're on a three-second latency satellite connection. Uh, another important thing is okay is that uh, uh, again network. Uh, many people assume that network connected connectivity is a given, and it's kind of uh, really really important to be able to gracefully handle issues. So that if something fails, uh, it's important to be able to continue where you left off. And uh, this might sound like an obvious thing to do. But uh, it's not always the case. Now, um, I just uh, I haven't uh, written the slides about this, but I wanted just to mention that uh, uh, Tarot is Warpsync protocol, which actually has a few really really nice properties, which they actually uh, did uh, did think about these uh, issues. One of them is was that um, so latency. As I said, the biggest issue with the tracing was that it just takes too many network requests to go back and forth, back and forth to download all the data. Now, what Parity did is that they uh, prepared a snapshot of the state, the entire state, and then peers can actually, instead of downloading it uh, one by one try node, they just download it, it in big lumps of data and reconstruct it on the remote side. Now, the really good benefit is, there are actually two benefits. One of them is, uh, that network packet-wise, it's probably, I, I can't say a number, but I would say maybe you can get it in a thousand network packets, it's just a random number, whereas fast sync requires a million. So it's a few orders of magnitude smaller, so you completely get rid of latency. And the other really important aspect, really nice uh, property of uh, the warp sync protocol, is that um, it reduces the load on the serving node. So if I uh, if I have the fast sync and if I have to look up uh, 300 try nodes, that's 300 disk accesses, and I get almost no data out of it. Whereas with the warp sync protocol, if I if the remote node, if I ask for a chunk, it's I don't know two megabytes, that's a single lookup, and I get an insane amount of data out of it. So um, from this perspective, the uh, the warp sync protocol is a huge improvement, but it also has two downsides. It's always about trade-offs, I guess. One of the downsides that uh, I do not know how much it is impacting parity nodes or not, so that maybe they can answer it, is that uh, uh, FastSync can handle dynamically changing data. Since I'm downloading tiny portions of the data, I can swap over to new tries and uh, just download the missing ones, whereas the WarpSync protocol cannot update data fast. So to create a new snapshot, it probably takes quite a while, which has two consequences. One of the consequences is that it's a load that nodes do it in the background, so you do have to prepare it. That's probably the least of the problem, I think, I'm not sure. Uh, the other problem is that if I prepare a snapshot in advance and I keep it for an epoch, that means that when a node syncs, it can get that uh, snapshot really fast, but then I have to re-execute every transaction on top of it, which depending on the node's computing power, might be fast or slow. So that's, uh, that was one of the issues that I have uh, with, uh, with, um, with this protocol. The other issue is that FastSync um, is proven to be correct, so to say, in that I, have, I start out from the root hash of the block that I want to sync, and every data that I download, I can immediately verify whether that's good data or bad data. 
Whereas if I want to download a state snapshot that is four gigabytes in size, and that contains a lot of stuff that is not directly tied to the root hash, then, uh, may, okay, this is, uh, I will admit it that I have limited knowledge about the protocol, so uh, feel free to correct me. But uh, as far as I know, um, the checksums and hashes of the snapshots are handled separately from the, from the root hash of the try itself, which means I actually need to trust a hash and then... Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, the question is, uh, when you are downloading chunks with warp sync, can you verify that they are surely part of the state try without downloading the entire snapshot? No, it, it actually, is this my phone? Yeah, is it? Uh, you guys can hear me, so. Yeah, but I think it's uh, recorded. Okay, uh, is it on now? Yes, uh, so yeah, you have to download all the state chunks and uh, reconstruct the entire the entire tree. It's actually because the, the snapshots are basically just uh, the leaves of the tree and the code with some uh, uh, specific kinds of compression applied, like uh, deduplicating the code, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so essentially, um, then that's, yes. So uh, as long as I think the same thing kind of holds that if you if you got um, a root hash so to say for the snapshots that is trusted from somehow or you manage to get be lucky and find a good one then it's an awesome protocol but it's a bit vulnerable from this perspective now arguably maybe from user experience point of view it's a good trade off so that that's completely fair but it's still uh, from a security yes. So one major kind of uh, failure that I personally have seen both in GEF and Parity fasting is where you basically start the process and then halfway through it stops for whatever reason and you have to restart it from scratch. Uh, it doesn't restart from scratch, just okay. it didn't remember how many nodes it downloaded. So oh. that, that's a typical user interface uh, counter issue and it was fixed in the last release. Oh, <laughs> cool. <Really>. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, so you, generally, I think uh, how many attackers you have in the network is a bit. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, vaccines and herd immunity. So if most of the nodes can handle most of the attacks, then it's not really worthwhile to come up with a really, really hard and expensive and hard to pull off attack. Whereas if you can find some vulnerability that most nodes are uh, susceptible to, then it, it kind of makes sense to try and push that hard. So I think. Um, this is such a thing that now I don't think we have many attacks, but um, it's nice to be able to somehow prevent, at least try to prevent most of them. Now, uh, for example, it's uh, again fast in mind. So, from this perspective, I think fast sync and warp sync are uh, both suboptimal, and I would vote for something in between. But uh, I won't go into that. Maybe I can do some benchmarks and propose a spec later on. So actually, there was an attack on fasting pretty recently. It was kind of funny. It was like one node that was uh, uh, trying to snipe other like fasting key nodes by sending. I think what was it, like block. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. There was a, a really awesome thing in the, in mainnet about half a year ago. When um, so the the way fasting worked in Go Ethereum was that. Um, you started to synchronize, and after you actually managed to fast sync for the first time, fast sync was disabled. Because obviously it's not safe to constantly fast sync. It's better to just go full sync from that point onward. And the code that checked whether fast sync was complete or not was whether you have a full block in your database available or not. So if you had a full block apart from the Genesis block, then we considered fast sync done, and you had to import everything. And there was a point in time, about half a year ago, when on the main network, when you connected to the main network, you almost immediately got block number one on a different fork. And that's it. And the point was that fast sync, although most of the time it's stable, as I said, network connectivity sucks in general. So it's almost, it's hugely improbable that you can start fast sync and finish it without any connectivity issues. So your master peer will eventually drop off. Now, if your master peer dropped off and you got block number one from random Joe in the network, then you just started to slow sync from block number two. And that was a, a really nasty thing. We're not really sure whether this was uh, malicious or um, 
so whether this was deliberate or accidental, because in theory, if somebody mines a block, starts mining on top of the Genesis block, then uh, because they are not in sync, we could assume that, yeah, he was just accidentally doing that. But uh, since this was happening for days on end, and we always got different block number ones on different forks, somebody was actually mining block number one. They weren't mining on top of that any anyway. So there are attempts. In, and even, for example, the testnet, the Runcode B test network constantly sees various, uh, luckily not networking layer attacks, but various other attacks. So people are trying to screw stuff up. So it seems like the ideal protocol might be to make some kind of snapshot of like basically some subtree for the set of all accounts that starts with some like prefix. Uh, so um, actually, I have one of those implemented. <laughs> oh, cool. um, so uh, still, I think that. Um, one ideal protocol that I was thinking about actually is to keep an up-to-date, kind of like an up-to-date list of uh, of the accounts without maintaining the Merkle proofs. Just let's suppose the latest, just the latest account list. The, the advantage of that would be it's fairly cheap to maintain. You, st you have to screw around with reorgs, that's a problem. But the account list itself is fa fairly cheap to maintain. So if I can uh, maintain that cheaply, then it means I can iterate that and send that over to the remote side cheaply. But what Parity, what would be different from Parity's warping protocol would be that instead of creating a snapshot in advance and hashing it and proving correctness in in, in different way, I could just the similar way send a chunk of accounts, contiguous accounts, and then actually prove it via Merkle proofs from the two directions that the accounts are actually part of the, the original state try. Now, the challenge here is that I cannot, since the try is dynamically uh, changing all the time, and uh, every 60 minutes I get a different try, it's essentially I won't have the time to download the entire try in the one uh, belonging to a single state try. So this is an issue, but it's solvable by actually just downloading these chunks. Let's suppose I download one first one million account, the second one, the second million account, etc. in chunks. These may belong to different tries, but these should get me most of the data. And if I run a fast sync on top of that, then that is an interesting question whether it could perform decent-ish or not. So this is something that, uh, the reason I, I didn't want to go into detail is because it's something that needs to be actually measured first because otherwise it's pointless. Is if you maintain that data structure, then you can also finally do the optimization where like, if you have any kind of account reading opcode, you just like, read to that directly instead of blocking down the entire street? Uh, yeah, so that definitely would be doable. Um, there are a few interesting properties that we need that... Uh, so uh, one, uh, one interesting aspect that it may or may not help is uh, I don't think most contracts on Ethereum may not uh, read so much. So. Um, if you access an account, then you most probably will update it. And if you update it, then you need to read the entire try anyway. Yeah, I guess like for me, I'm not as concerned about average fees behavior. I'm concerned, like especially now the transaction fees are about way back down and someone will do another DOS. Um, so what I was trying to do is that, okay, so, uh, so if somebody does a reading denial of service, then uh, this might help, yes. Just uh, average case, I don't think it will help. But for, for denial service, it might actually be a really good help. I think we have it in the branch. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, uh, I mean, this is about sharding, right? So, so far we heard a bit about like, <laughs> proof of work, uh, <laughs> blockchain sync. So, uh, yeah, for the sharding, so the thing is, Nobody really knows, uh, so at least I don't know. So what I, what I'm thinking about, like after those after those two days, is just that uh, yeah. So for the sharding network, because yeah, a lot of things are still unclear. So we can't really come up with a good protocol now, I guess. But even if uh, so, if some of these ideas actually get implemented in the end, then well, we have the role separation and things like that, and that will likely require like a more complicated network topology. Yeah, different protocols for different things. So I guess like the main things that you probably need to worry about is that number one, you can't have all the data get broadcast to to everyone anymore. You probably want like some notion of subnetwork for every for every shard. But then 
the other thing you need is to like validators get or call leaders get reassigned between shards quickly. So you need to be able to just like basically hop into whatever subset of the network. Yes. Yeah, gravitate on uh, demand. For example, one uh, one interesting aspect that we're thinking about uh, discussing yesterday was that. Uh, uh, basically, everybody can become a proposer. We will probably have a ton of them. So those are pretty safe people. Uh, everybody can be an executor. We'll probably have a ton of them. Those who be just mining will be pretty safe people. But the collators itself, those might be an endangered species since they have huge collaterals deposited as far as I know, if I understand. So I actually think that like the 1,000 ETH was probably like a bit too high. Like in practice, I expect maybe 10 to 100. Uh, okay, let's go with 100. Still, um, I wouldn't like to get that get it slashed. The point um, what I wanted to make is that although I, in theory I could have infinite proposers and infinite uh, executors, uh, the collators will be finite and have a lot to lose. And the pro from uh, the networking perspective, it means that it might be good to think about whether you want the collators to be public or not. For example, an interesting trick is that if you can, if you can actually, instead of having a, a network for collators or having the collators in your public, if instead if all the collators would just mask themselves as proposers and executors, both, then they have access to both networks. They can just behave as both of them. And the end result would be that from the outside, in theory, they are much harder to find and much harder to, to DOS. Yeah, so um, we, we, th we personally think after those two days that like, call it to DOS is going to be a problem. So that's why, yeah, so that's, 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 that's one of the things. Yeah, in general, uh, like, like the design of the, I think the design of the of the PDP protocol for sharding hasn't actually started yet, as far as I know. Like I mean, maybe there's ideas, but nobody's really started. So it's kind of important to keep in mind that yeah, like for for someone like me, these questions are the are the, are the important questions, and then yeah, like we we, we uh, so and then in the end, what 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 the answers to those questions are going to mean is that we will likely have to come up with like better mechanisms to achieve the topology that we want. We have to come up with like the, the right topology in the first place. We can we can make almost anything work. It's just more of a question is like what 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 do we even want? Like, so, and I think that's like not, not clear yet. Yeah. Um, yesterday we had a really good conversation on the way to dinner um, after the rent discussion, um, and I've talked to a bunch of people about this, but it's probably good to broadcast this to everybody. Um, so the state size versus the chain data size is like 3 gigs versus 57 gigs for the chain data. Mm -hmm. So blockchain rent is focusing on those like 3 gigs, whereas like the chain state itself is the majority of the like usability problem. No, um, no, 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 rent focus on the usability state. problem might be the, the state is the usability problem, the rest is just an annoyance. Sorry, uh, when I say usability problem, I mean m the, the footprint on my hard drive is giant. Um, so, like, personally, like, I, don't think, I actually don't think that each client should be storing more than a few percent of the history. So, what we talked through a decent amount of this yesterday, and it looked really feasible to do network level sharding for that information as, yeah. like, a really easy opt-in thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's likely something that we're going to be looking into in the near-term future. It doesn't require yeah, any protocol changes, nothing like that. Um, so it could be very reasonable to drop that hard drive footprint to like sub 10 gigs. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Yeah. Um, so we have, uh, but like with upcoming consensus changes, we're going to move to a like a weak subjectivity model anyway. And then you can just throw away everything before the recent client checkpoint. Fair. Um, the you may need it in if you have some dApp where you care about like seeing what stock trades you made five years ago, but then like it makes sense to just have second layer markets for that. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I wanted to toss onto there was that um, with the idea of self-authenticating blocks, I don't know, uh, of stateless clients, and again, that stuff not actually needing a protocol change um, for us to execute those kind of things. Define protocol change. Sorry, sorry, a consensus protocol change or anything like that. Um, it, and this is a like naive assertion because I have only been thinking about this for the last day or something. But um, it seems really feasible for us to implement a 
new sync mode that fits somewhere weirdly in the middle of all of them, where assuming we can what, get that's the only way out. Uh, where we can get witness data, then we can do a version of like ultra fast warp sync, whatever you want to call it, where it operates using benevolent witnesses generated by other people to stay up with the head of the chain while it backfills everything. Uh, yeah, so uh, actually I have two comments for you, you Piper. The problem is still that, uh, so for witness data, the question is how large will that data be? Because if it's, um, so it's, uh, there was somewhere yesterday or today on the slide that uh, we would replace uh, this guy with bandwidth. Now this guy may suck, but it will still be faster than bandwidth most of the time at least. So it's, uh, it's if we can, it's, it's a fine line to thread, especially um, if, uh, if we start talking about, let's say, so it can be a denial of service attack vector. Let's say if I figure out a way to make the witness data 100 megabytes, then good luck. So that will completely screw up things. So there are specific contexts where you have like lots and lots of bandwidth, but storage is expensive. So like EPSs particularly would probably find like a hundred, they might even find a hundred megabyte witnesses trivial on the corresponding blocks very hard. You, me, oh yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I, so I can imagine that there are instances, but uh, my issue is that, uh, so if um, if it would be something opt-in, but each node could decide whether they want to do or forward uh, witness data or not, that may work, but let's, but the problem is that witness data disappears at the first node that refuses to forward it, which kind of means that unless we have a really strong backbone that keeps forwarding witness data, it might uh, might eventually, yeah, it, basically it can happen that you'll have a small minor network that keeps forwarding witness data between themselves and the main network might not benefit so much. Yeah, you just have a separate temple for that. Oh, yeah, that's, that's not good. <laughs> Wait, why not? It's kind of what we need. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and uh, uh, to react to the uh, pruning the database, I'm not sure whether you meant uh, deleting old blocks and everything receipts or not. Uh, you, well, I mean, Okay, is this on? Uh, so everything before the, the, the header checkpoint hash, just deleting, I guess, block headers, receipts, block bodies. I mean, but archival nodes that store them could be somewhat sharded, okay, like uh, you store uh, these 2048 and these 2048 and these 2048 based on your, your node ID or something like that, uh, but. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, one problem that might arise uh, out of that is uh, with dev developers in general, that I've seen a, a few dApps out there, for example, Akasha, which rely heavily on logs to, so basically they figured out that it's cheaper to emit a log than to save a storage entry in the contract database for the contract storage. And this means that the only way Akasha can look up a post the user made is actually to filter the chain, which is insanely, both insanely expensive locally, plus screws with this pruning approach, but it's cheap for them. Well, my, my thought about this is rather that we can do these kind of things, but we also need to be aware of who we're breaking. I mean, especially since we've been telling people to use logs all the time, so you know, now, now they're using it, and it's like a bad thing. <laughs> so, yeah, it's definitely an issue. So I don't know what else. Like maybe, like I mean, you had comments on all the other talks. Maybe you have some more comments. <laughs> Or anyone else, more questions? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we spoke about this uh, offline yesterday, but I think it's important to relay this to the other Jari implementation teams. So can you speak more about um, your thoughts on like extending dev P2P or starting something completely from scratch, such as working on lib P2P? Oh, I see. Yeah, so that thing. So I, we didn't include it in this uh, thing because I feel it's more of a like low-level concern. So like how the stuff gets transported isn't that relevant. Like, but it's still, yeah, so we, we, we're doing changes to, to that PDP because, yeah, it's like really old and we have, yeah, it's kind of a shitty protocol. I don't know. Basically, do you think it's extensible to make it good or it should be like basically well, so starting there's a bunch of like efforts. So one effort is that, yeah, we, we're definitely trying out the PDP stuff. I mean, Parity is working on an implementation of PDP. We have a prototype of Whisper on PDP, so we're like trying to make it work and see how good it is. On the discovery side, 
Yeah, I have like kind of I presented it at DEF CON. Like I have some ideas like how to improve the whole peer discovery thing so we can make certain things much easier. V5. Yeah, so like this this whole V5 thing. So yeah, we're still working on that. Just recently, uh, through this uh, Eclipse attack thing, we kind of realized that we need like maybe more sort of discovery mechanisms than just as DHT. So we're working on, on like on sort of an alternative, and that's going to be a lot use, uh, like super useful also for nodes that just can't join a DHT, which is kind of a common case also. And um, yeah, so these things. But I feel like they're not as relevant now because it's more like a low level, like how the whole thing works, and then. Yeah, in the end, you know, like these th these are just facilities that you can use, and I think I, I, I always think that yeah, with the current network, we kind of have almost all the facilities that we need to make the current ETH network okay, and then uh, yeah, like we don't need <coughs> anything much fancier, but for um, yeah, but like for <laughs> for the sharding network is like a whole different story. It's just like way more things that we might need, and we just like. For me, it's just always like we should just wait and see what we need, and then we can make those things happen. For example, from a sharding perspective, one kind of important question that needs to be answered um, is, uh, for example, if we do we want to have a single overlay network, single communication network for all the shards, or do we want to have separate ones for individual shards? The, inter the reason why this is an interesting question is because if you look at the the main network versus test network now, if you want to join ROPS, then good luck finding peers. And the reason is that uh, in Ethereum world, the discovery protocol doesn't differentiate between uh, peers from uh, mainnet, testnet, or all the other forks. You just find it, connect to it, and then hope that it's something that you want. And uh, so it works okay for mainnet, because most nodes are on mainnet, but if you want to find somebody not on mainnet, then that's a huge issue. Now, if, um, if we introduce 10 shards and each shards will have 10 peers on it, then uh, maybe you can wait it out until you find peers, but if you're a collator and you want to jump fast between them, then you're kind of doomed. Isn't so, V5 supposed to fix? Yeah, it's supposed, yeah. It's supposed to fix this issue, yeah. So, so you, you'll at least be able to like, find the other guys who are also interested in that shard. So that, that that's one thing, but then the other question is, yeah, like how how should how should they be connected? But like be, be, the most important part is more yeah for for the sharding specifically is the most important part is like how to find the other guys on the shard, and then yeah that's also on the side also going to solve this issue where yeah like if you want to find some rocks and peers. <laughs> so um, yeah that's one thing. Yeah with the whole structure that that, that was like another thing. So we've been looking like we we keep looking for excuses to somehow like turn this into a structured network, but we just don't know if it if it makes sense. So um, it can make sense for some things. So and many people ask me this question, like why don't you use like a more optimal uh, sort of, I don't know, multicast thing for, for, for block propagation, for example. So it's uh, just always, th this question comes up a lot. So but, and but then- the structure, So the problem with structured networks is specifically that uh, they, can, they are deterministic and they can be attacked. Yeah, there is an downside to it, but then the question is- more <laughs> a big, big, big downside. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just a downside to everything. I mean, that's just yeah, that's just how these things are. Uh, but uh, yeah, like more specifically about the sharding. So maybe like one of my questions is like more more specifically like in some cases what I've seen in the in the last two days is that in in certain cases you have sort of communication between two specific nodes on a network. So if you have like a certain proposal and you want to give like some uh, would give a, uh, feedback about that or something like that, then you actually need to talk to the originator of the proposal. And in that case. You have a situation that we don't have right now where you want to talk to a specific node. And then in those cases, it can be, yeah, it can be useful to think about, like maybe we should, yeah, introduce routing or something like that, yeah, for, for, for messages like that. But it's just, yeah, it's just unclear to me. Like, it would be super nice if we could maintain the state that we have now, where, yeah, your exact peer set doesn't matter so much because it makes things a lot easier and it's a lot more robust. But yeah, if we have to have something like that, then yeah, we have to find a, we have to find a way to, yeah, add routing. <laughs> cool. Are we, like, done? Or yeah. any more questions? Yeah, I guess maybe this is... This is a, a bit more general one, but we have um, call leaders switching shards all the time, right? So uh, mm -hmm. it seems like they would have to switch which peers they're connected to all the time just to, to, to deal with that. Yeah. Have you considered just having the, the call leaders move from shards less, less frequently? Mm, that would like hurt security properties. 
So I guess, and the other thing is that that like exactly how frequently call uh, exactly how frequently call leaders need uh, need to move between shards also depends on the number of call leaders. So for example, if you have like 100,000 call leaders and 100,000 call leaders are between 100 shards, then that would basically be like any call leader would on average be selected one every thousand periods, which literally means once a day. So, you know, like, we'd be, like that would only be an issue if the number of call leaders is fairly small. So the other thing to consider about this whole like call leader switching networks, so uh, for especially for the for the for the call leader role, we can have pretty high standards when it comes to the network connectivity. So they gotta have like a decent link. They gotta support like UDP properly and things like that. And probably same for the proposals as well. You just have to have like a good. You just basically can't run the proposal on your on your phone. And that doesn't mean people won't. Well, we can just prevent them from from doing that by making the protocol. Like, Hard enough, I don't know, like or incompatible enough with mobile networks. I, I don't, I don't know. Like there can be a lot of things, a lot of ways to do that. But what I'm trying to say is that we can have pretty high requirements for these clients because in the end, with the with especially with the with the sharding network, it turns out that because this protocol is supposed to be so flexible, so you have this whole scale between very light clients and slightly less light clients. In the end, I mean, most users are going to run some form of light client. And for those people, the, the issues that came up earlier in the sync, they, they, they do kind of matter because yeah, these people have a pretty shitty connection, but for, for the for the nodes that actually run the network, that make proposals, that collate these proposals, <laughs> um, yeah, you kind of have to, uh, yeah, they, they can have, we can have much higher standards. And then it also means that we can, can, can come up with a totally custom protocol that just optimizes for super fast switching, for example. Like this is not, not totally out of the question. I still have the question that, for example, if you have, uh, you assume that you have super fast networks, but what happens if you have to cross the firewall between China and the world? So yeah. will you just say that, uh, so you can't just say that, okay, we'll leave China out of Ethereum network because you have slow internet access. So yeah, that's like a whole different kind of worms with the whole, like, yeah, how to, <laughs> to cross the firewall. Yeah, but it's, you shouldn't ignore cases like this. Yeah. Oh yeah. So we we've had some this like there have there have been discussions about this in the past. So there's only so much we can do to um, work against. Uh, yeah, let let's call it like internet restrictions, right? So uh, there's some things we can do like we in the for the in the whole like discovery v five discussion huge topic that isn't really resolved yet is the whole question of like protocol obfuscation. So how much obfuscation do you want? Do you want obfuscation at all? Do you want like full on encryption? For that protocol, it's kind of hard to achieve that. It, like, it's gonna hurt performance a lot, so maybe we don't want that. But then in the end, like all of these things, they always, this is like a game you, you, you can never win. Because you can, you can win it with like really strong encryption, but then your protocol is like too secure. So there's, yeah, we just have to find like a, 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 a good way to handle that, I guess. But specifically for the issue of like, Collator and China blocked by firewall. I guess we should just keep that case in mind. <laughs> um, by the way, do we have any kind of like analytics to tell how well like miners of nodes work in, in China or like anywhere for that matter? Um, no. Okay. Well, we just no, that's not yeah. true. So we have some you know, we have some issues on the tracker where people say you know I'm in China, so maybe that's the source of my problems. But that's not really measurable. Yeah, that's not really measurable. So we, the, in general, the whole thing is pretty hard to measure. Like we, we tried before, and it's just not. You know, it's just. Yeah, yeah, he said it in, in, in Mexico, but we haven't really talked since then. <laughs> so you had a question also. There's a lot of research about um, different types of net network topologies. Uh, one of the popular ones uh, today is um, uh, of dragonfly topology in which you have some kind of a tree and the leaves are a highly interconnected network. Now these are structured networks as uh, Peter doesn't like it, but uh, there is also a lot of research on, on, on how to randomize links uh, in these structured networks and I think there are some ideas that could be extracted from uh, from this literature and maybe, maybe it's worth looking at it. Yeah, cool. You can just send it to me or put it in the Gitter. Like there's a, oh yeah, there's a Deaf P2P GitHub channel. <laughs> you should totally join the channel. No, just joking. But <laughs> there's like 10 people in there. So.
may be slightly crazy out of field idea, but uh, uh, if, if finding fast peers is a, is a problem on the network, would it be possible to uh, financially incentivize um, these peers to come online and provide bandwidth? Oh yeah, that's that's actually totally a thing. So, they, so some people have already do this, and yeah, like there is definitely also a market for that. And I think it will become even more important in the future. Uh, do, do you know who's doing that? Uh, so, I kind of saw it yesterday because someone <laughs> opened a, like a, a pull request on Go Ethereum to add some feature around peer management, and I was checking their GitHub, and they have like a sort of like a DAP where you can buy, I think what's it like, light client server capacity or something. Well, that looked really cool. Go DAP. I should look. If I wanted to look into that, I'd look at the Go DAP. At the what? Oh, sorry, the Go like what client? Uh, go Ethereum. Go Ethereum. Uh, there's an issue with that. So. Okay. I can just yeah. Also like, oh, right. yeah. I don't really know like who who this person is or something. I just thought it's cool that like people are actually doing this. And, you know. I didn't think it was pretty obvious that someone's going to do. It. Yeah, of course. Like we we we, we want that stuff. Actually, isn't it that's, isn't that the first business model? Yeah, sure. In Fora. <laughs> <laughs> Asking for. <laughs> Any other questions? Not that. I guess thank you. All right.